Well, as you know, for those of you that have been journeying with us the past number of weeks, we've been walking through a season of teaching that we've been referring to as empowered, and we've been specifically looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church in Corinth, to the believers there, and he's educating them and teaching them what it means to have spiritual gifts, what it means to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, not just in an individual way that connects us to the body, but also in a way that equips us and empowers us to serve him in a much greater way. Now, over the past number of weeks, we've found that the book of 1 Corinthians, as we've unwrapped that and peeled that open, we've seen that 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter, it invites us into this concept of the body of believers. It sets the table for us to understand why we do what we do here on a Sunday. Why, why we are not just asked to call and step into this life and travel alone, but 1 Corinthians and the Apostle Paul remind us why we're called to do this together. But then he moves further and he introduces us to this idea of spiritual gifts where he says it's incredibly important for us to travel together, but not just together, there's also some ways individually which we, he has equipped each person who follows Christ to serve him, to, to lead into what he's doing. And these are called spiritual gifts. We've looked at a number of the specific spiritual gifts the last couple of weeks as Pastor Jeremy has brought the word to us. And it's no small thing. If you really think about what's revealed in the pages of Scripture, and you think about the fact that God's Holy Spirit wouldn't just want to dwell within a group of people, but he would very specifically, in a powerful way, equip each man, woman, child who follows after Jesus with gifts that come from God's spirit, that carry God's authority, that carry God's power. It's no small thing. Paul lays this out for us. But then we turn one more page into our scripture reading for today, and we find this funny little set of verses in 1 Corinthians 13, often referred to as the chapter of love. I don't know if you've read your, but there's some teenagers in the room. If, if maybe you've ever not been that interested in reading your Bible, did you know there's a chapter of love? In the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13 is often referred to that way. We've sometimes seen it read at weddings. We've sometimes had it seen in, you know, Valentine's Day type teaching settings where we hear these words that we read just a few moments ago about the love of God. Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul, he takes that chapter and he really lays some context to us that maybe we haven't always identified before. Because in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul describes the foundation of what it means to be the body of believers. He's really using these 13 verses in this chapter to help us understand what we should be standing on, where we should be finding our footing. And Paul describes it. He tells us very clearly, it's in the immovable, necessary, absolutely critical foundation of love that all of these spiritual gifts and all of this power of the Spirit and all of this camaraderie within the brothers and sisters and the family of believers, all of it should be standing on this firm and solid foundation of love. We are called not just to step into the body of Christ and use our gifts. We are called to do so with love. Because without love, the kind of love we read about in 1 Corinthians 13, without that love, our efforts are useless. You know, it's often a difficult journey, I think, for the church to move into the teaching of 1 Corinthians 13 and not by default think about how it applies to the world around us. Because we are called to love our neighbor, aren't we? If we follow Jesus, we are called to love those around us, whether they follow Jesus or not. But what Paul points out as sometimes a bit of a stark reminder is that's not actually who this chapter was written for us to think of. Because you see, in the Corinthian church... They were learning about the spiritual gifts. They were discovering them. They were trying to learn what it meant to serve and follow Christ together as a body of believers. But when they got into the actual nitty-gritty of doing that, they weren't really taking care of each other. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13 to the Christian church to help them learn how to take care of one another. Because he could see that they were doing such a poor job of loving the brother and sister in their midst, there was no hope that they were going to be able to take God's truth out of the church. And share it with those who didn't know him. So he said, no, this is not just an approach that we need to have with the world that we're called to. This is how we ought to treat one another. And he says, friends, pay attention to the kind of love that God has for you. Because this is the kind of love that you need to grow in with one another. It's the kind of love that 
doesn't have to exist just because we gather together, but it exists when we invite God's spirit to help nurture those gifts within us. And then we set aside ourselves and we say, Lord, I want to follow you and I will have the selfless kind of love that's necessary within my own family, my own family of faith. Love necessitates that we accept one another despite our differences. It it necessitates that we know one another with all of our different stories and variables and experiences. Love necessitates that we edify one another, that we build one another up, not tear one another down, which sometimes the church is as guilty of as anybody else. Love necessitates that we see God in one another. Today, we're going to invite you into a story. And it's not just into a story, but it's into an opportunity to listen for God's voice, to hear who God has been to someone else in our midst, So that you can compare and see how perhaps in many of the same ways or perhaps in different ways that maybe God has been the same to you. And so as we prepare to hear our story, and Hazel, I'd love to invite you up. I want to invite you to step into these next few moments with a heart to listen and with a heart to love. A heart to look at the others here that are around you, to think of the others that exist outside of this building, And to think about the others in your life with the heart of love that is described in 1 Corinthians 13. But also, I invite you, as you listen, to let let the story wash over you, the scripture that is found in it. Let that wash over you. Receive the love of Jesus Christ yourself in these moments. Because this is the love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13, and it's a love that's for you. So I invite you to join us and hear this story now. that wondrous night. It was at a young age, possibly five years old, when my mother asked me one night, Hazel, if the Lord Jesus were to come tonight, would you be ready to go with him? And I answered, no. I must have been encouraged to ask Jesus Messiah into my heart, which I did, And in that simple act that night, Hazel became a Christian. What actually happened that night, that wondrous night, to that five-year-old little girl? There was a declaration in heaven. And it was declared that Hazel is no longer guilty. Hazel is declared righteous. Her guilt of sin, past, present, and future is canceled. And she is credited with righteousness. This declaration is valid because Jesus Messiah died to pay the death penalty of her sin. His blood covering over her sin so that my holy, just wrath has been appeased and so that my love for her has achieved its aim. And this declaration is valid because Jesus Messiah lived a life of perfect righteousness, keeping the whole law And that righteousness can be imputed or ascribed to her. Hazel is now incorporated into Jesus Messiah, even as he is in her by my Holy Spirit, who will do the work of transforming her into the likeness the image of Jesus Messiah, to the glory, the excellence of God the Father. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, put it this way, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And these he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. God will finish his work. No wonder there was such a great noise, a great celebration in heaven regarding the declaration made about that five-year-old Hazel. However, did I know all that took place in heaven that night? I did not. Did I understand everything that took place in heaven that night? No, I did not. And it took many, many years for me to begin to grasp the wonder of it. But I knew something had happened, for I woke the next morning with a sense of excitement, of anticipation, as when my dad would wake us and pile us into the car while it was still dark to go on vacation. It took a wee while for me to realize that wasn't it. Rather, I had asked Jesus Messiah to come and live in me. And that little girl believed it. That wondrous night, the almighty El Shaddai cut an everlasting love covenant with me through Jesus Messiah and in holy love obligated himself to me, knowing everything that would follow in the years ahead. There were a number of factors that influenced my growing up, and in fact, who I am today. The first was that wondrous night, but there were also my parents and fear, suffocating fear. I was born the middle child to Christian parents whom I came to understand had strong, influential personalities honed or sharpened through hardship and suffering. My dad, an athlete, had contracted polio in his late 20s, working as a medical technologist in a pathological laboratory. That illness and the fierce fight for recovery and subsequent disability changed his life and ours. Graciously, God had gifted him with a passion for evangelism and an accompanying gift as a teacher of his word. I was privileged to grow up under some of the best teaching imaginable. My mother, through tragic circumstances in her growing up years, had learned to be fiercely independent and achieved success valiantly through sheer determination before she married my father. As I grew, I came to understand that she gave up much to marry dad and devote her life to being the best wife, mother, and co-worker she could be. She worked passionately by his side and my childhood became that of being thrown into all the activities of my parents, founding and running a work with young people in the local English high school under the umbrella of Scripture Union. There were years of meetings, studies, camps, get-togethers. My dad taught, did all the setting up and construction if necessary, while my mum played the piano, cooked and counseled, and together they were an incredible team. And I watched. And I listened. Unaware that the Holy Spirit was faithfully, actively fulfilling his work in Hazel as declared in heaven that wondrous night. However, even such spiritually strong, active, gifted, loving parents could not protect me 
from the realities of growing up in a frightening, evil environment. Growing up in South Africa, the country of my birth, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, meant apartheid, that evil, wicked system. And apartheid was the order of the day. I was born into it, knowing nothing else. South Africa was and remains a violent country. It was as if I was born knowing that, and my first experience with it was when I was very young. From that time onward, I was to develop a fear that would eventually become a part of me, never leaving me, controlling me, exhausting me, dictating how I would behave, where I would go, when I would go, and with whom. It became a fear that I could taste, and every traumatic event, happening, violation, only served to reinforce the ever-growing belief that had taken root in me. You are not safe, ever. And so, when I was about 15 years old, I read, possibly for the first time in my morning devotions, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely, he will save you from the fowler's snare. I was aghast. How could that be in the Bible? It was not true. I had not been kept safe, and the only way I could deal with the perceived betrayal was to promise myself that never, ever again would I read that psalm. And I believe the sovereign, wise, good God, Jehovah Elohim, who had covenanted himself to me, wept with me and encircled me with his mercy and grace as he watched that young girl listen instead to the lie whispered by a powerful enemy who was seeking only to kill her trust, steal her peace, and destroy her. You are never safe. And Hazel exchanged the truth about God for that lie. A few years later, I sat on the lawn and listened to my dad teach a group of postgraduates what would become one of his favorite themes, the doctrine of man, as found in Genesis 1 through 3. I learned for the first time why God had created me and what my purposeful being was all about. I learned that I was created to be what I was meant to be, a reflector of my creator. By doing what I was meant to do, correctly handling God's creation. How? By creating, like God my creator, by subduing the earth like God my creator, by having dominion and ruling like my creator. And when I do that, God my creator is glorified. I am satisfied and creation benefits. 
I cannot tell you how excited that made me. And I knew that day I need never ask again, why am I here? But knowing my purpose for living, being a reflector, did nothing to allay my deep, deep fear. And so some years later, I met a Christian Canadian, agreed to marry him and moved to Canada, where I now understand I believed I could finally be safe. But I was to discover that mankind is the same the whole world over. Wickedness, selfishness, and self-interest is everywhere. The prophet Jeremiah said, the heart of mankind is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked or arrogant. Who can even know their own deceitful heart? Certainly not Hazel. And so she came to a new country full of new hopes and dreams, but continued to be deceived by that lie that the powerful enemy used to continue to kill, steal, and destroy her. How then does one live, for all intent and purposes, the life one thought they were going to have does not materialize? How does one live when disappointment and confusion grow menacingly day by day, year by year, particularly when trust is eroded? I did what I believe is instinctive to human beings who lose trust in humanity. I took control of my life. I would simply lose myself in my purpose for being. I would simply escape in the doing what I was meant to do. And I threw myself into teaching, schools, camps, retreats, outreach events, and much more trying to relieve that as yet unidentified ache. And God, the sovereign Elohim who had obligated himself to that young five-year-old girl that wondrous night, was glorified, that is, placed in excellent display, but not because of Hazel. I was now reflecting me, having taken control. Watch how I do it. But I repeat, God was glorified simply because he is glorious, excellent, complete, perfect. He never needed me to be glorious. He had invited me to find the greatest purpose in my life as a creature by imaging, by reflecting Elohim, my creator, who already was, is, and always will be glorious. And me? Was I satisfied? With all my being, I knew I was not. In fact, I was being crushed by the realization I was a fake, something I absolutely detested and despised in other people. Then it happened. I was told not to return home as it was no longer safe. I was unprepared for this. My parents, who about 25 years previously had chosen to make Canada their home as well, these parents who had agonized watching the scenario being played out before them, supporting in whatever way possible, without interfering with what they believed was God's purpose, had just died within six months of each other. So, do not return home what would I do? Where would I go? What did I do? While all of heaven held its breath, 
having been witness to that incredible declaration, Hazel put her hands over her ears and ran, shouting as she ran, it's okay, Elohim, I've got this. I'll take things from here. Your record of keeping watch over me has not exactly been stellar. Don't know where I'll go, but I'll handle it. Please allow me to say humbly, gently, and very carefully that I have slowly but surely come to understand what happens when we as creatures turn our back on Elohim, our creator, declaring on earth, I won't trust you, my creator. In fact, I'll even deny you exist. Then I'll take control of me, my life, my purpose for being, and I will do it all my way. I have come to understand that Elohim has such perfect, whole respect for the way he created me, you, us, with free will, with the ability to choose our own destiny, that he actually takes his hands off one saying, okay, Hazel, I hear you. I will let you have your way. I will let you do things your way, but you will discover my law of my universe. What you sow, you will reap. Now, did that mean that there was another declaration in heaven? I rescind everything that happened to five-year-old Hazel. I take it all back. Oh, thank God, no. Elohim had cut covenant with me through Jesus Messiah. And God, Elohim never breaks covenant. But I chose to move out from under the umbrella of infinite blessings and promises that I had in Jesus Messiah. His love and his goodness never ceased. They can't. This is who he is. Jehovah God is love. Jehovah God is good. But I chose to walk out from under that umbrella of God's special blessings for Hazel and instead found myself reaping consequence after consequence of doing things my way, having exchanged the truth about God for a lie. You see, after I left, trying desperately to make it on my own and frankly not managing, a dear friend, a non-Christian friend who had watched it all happen, had said to me, Hazel, please, won't you let me take care of you? And despite everything I knew to be right, everything I had been taught and taught myself, I once again put my hands over my ears <clears throat> and said to Jehovah God, let me do it my way. What miserable years followed. I was utterly miserable and made everyone's life around me miserable. I truly experienced the misery of the prodigal son and finally, like him, could stand my rebellion towards God, my creator, and his wise, good, and perfect ways no longer. And one afternoon found me in a pastor's office admitting, you do not know me, but I am sick and tired of running from God. And for the next hour, poured out my story to him. He did not interrupt. 
but at the end said that there was only one thing I needed to know at that time, that there was nothing I could do right then that would make God love me more. And there was nothing I could do that would make him love me less. I returned to my car, put my head on the steering wheel and whispered, Oh God, my God, that was you in there. And God's Holy Spirit awakened in me the desire, the passion to know that God who loved me that much despite me. And so morning after morning, he drew me away for that short while and I read and read. My mainstay literature, besides the Bible, became uh, J.I. Packer's Knowledge of the Holy, no, sorry, Knowing God by J.R. Packer and Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. But life continued to have to be lived with the harvest, the consequences of what I had sown earlier. And it was hard, very hard. I struggled. I wept. I did what needed doing. I wept some more. I fought. I wept and wept. And the Holy Spirit faithfully continued to draw, sometimes even drag me back, morning after morning, lovingly keeping that deep thirst to know God real. And then again, it happened. In one explosion, that deepest, most evil betrayal I had known happened. There was nothing and no words to describe it. My dear husband of now 10 years and I sat in the front room, clinging to each other in a kind of stupid silence. I could not read. I could not pray. And left it to those closest to me to weep and pound heaven's doors and ask the why. Friends from Medicine Hat drove up and drove us back to their beautiful home. And in that walkout basement, I returned to reading the book my son had given me a year or two prior, a book which I had not had the courage to finish reading. This time, however, I felt the pull of the gentle Holy Spirit's desire to open my eyes, and for the first time, I truly saw Hazel who she had become in her tireless efforts to protect herself all her life, having rejected the God, Jehovah Elohim, of Psalm 91. What I saw was frightening, sickening, despicable. I fell to my knees and sobbed before God as the full impact of who I had become almost overwhelmed me. And the living almighty El Shaddai put his arms around me, the same one who had cut covenant with me that wondrous night and held me. I rose and continued reading. The next chapter was entitled Repentance. I was taken aback. I was the victim here. Why did I need to repent? The author took me to Isaiah 50, verses 10 and 11. Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. But now, all you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go, walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you will receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. 
Once again, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to see what I by myself could not see. In very naturally, lighting my own fires and providing my own flaming torches, I had actually turned my back on God as a rebel, declaring my own intrinsic self-sufficiency to handle everything on my own, independent of the one who had made me. With the help of our dear friend's safe, compassionate small group, I was able to turn around in repentance and slowly but surely, leaving my fires and flaming torches behind, allow the one who had made that declaration all those years ago to wrap his all-powerful, his omnipotent, safe arms around me. And I moved in a little closer. In the days, weeks, and months that followed, that same God, Elohim blessed me with beginning to fulfill my desire to truly know him in my mind as well as in daily living. His Holy Spirit walked me through the book of Hebrews using Ray Stedman's What More Can God Say to flame the excitement. I read statements like, What is the gospel? The message of the gospel, the good news, is that it takes God to be a man, anthropos, not male. You cannot be a man without God. It takes Christ to be a Christian and put God back into the man. That is the good news. That is the gospel. And I also read that the indwelling Christ, Messiah, offers to clothe himself with my personality and is prepared to live his life over again in my circumstances right where I am. I literally trembled with excitement and told God that if that were true, it was one of the most profound thoughts I could hold on to at that time. That study once again ignited in me the passion to know my purpose for which I had been created, to be what I was meant to be, a reflector, by doing what I was meant to do, correctly handling God's creation like him. But nothing yet had satisfied that gnawing, won't-go-away thought but why all the suffering? What was the purpose of it? I knew it had purpose as God's child, but what? On a trip to BC in Parksville Baptist Church, I was introduced to a study of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and Daryl Johnson's book, Discipleship on the Edge. I had never before heard Revelation taught with such excitement, encouragement, and conviction. What a thrill! As I was introduced to a Jesus Messiah I simply had not known before. Not just the Jesus of the Gospels, but a glorious risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, Jesus, Messiah. That glorious, risen, exalted Jesus, Messiah, reigning even now as King of kings and Lord of lords, that I had missed all those years. I reached Revelation chapter 4 and discovered with my spiritual eyes an open door in heaven. Through that door I saw a throne and someone sitting on that throne. And I, Hazel, was invited up by the Holy Spirit into the control center of the universe. The control center of Canada, of Sherwood Park, my home, my life. 
It was so glorious, I did not want to leave morning after morning. Then in chapter 5, I saw the one on the throne with a scroll in his right hand. That scroll that contains the full account of what God, in his sovereign will, has determined as the destiny of his world. That scroll that contains the completeness of God's plan for rectifying what is wrong and establishing his gracious rule in the world. His plan for bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. That scroll that contains the meaning of history, world history, your history, my history. But then that question rings out. Who is worthy to open the scroll to break the seven seals? Who is worthy to interpret and to bring about that plan to completion. Who has the wisdom? Who has the power to do that? No one was found worthy of such a supreme task. And the Apostle John weeps. Then one of the elders speaks to him and he turns to look at the elder who says, look, John, the lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And John turns to look at the throne. Again, but what happens next changed the way I was to see everything on earth. He turns, expecting to see a roaring lion, but he turns and sees a lamb as if slain with seven horns, complete power, and seven eyes, complete wisdom, standing in the center of the throne. The lion had triumphed. The lion was worthy to open the scroll. But John turns and sees a lamb, a slain lamb. The lion had triumphed, had overcome as a lamb, a sacrificial lamb. And that is why he alone is worthy to open the scroll. Only he has the wisdom and power of God. I was profoundly affected by this. And over the next while, Messiah, God's slain lamb, came close to me and I began to hear, Hazel, I stand at the center of everything as the risen, glorious King of Kings, and I suffer. Isaiah 53 tells you that. And so, in all your suffering, I was, I am, there, in the very center of it all. Nobody knows the trouble you've seen. Nobody knows but me. Everything that they did to you, they did to me. But Hazel, I overcame your suffering. I triumphed over your fear, not as a roaring lion, but as a sacrificed lamb. The secret of world history, of your history, is that I overcame when I suffered on the cross. And that is how I overcame all suffering, by suffering with and for the world. I, I overcame evil by walking into it, confronting it with truth, and where need be, taking all of that evil dishes out, absorbing it into myself, 
and so diffusing it with perfect wisdom, perfect power, and I overcame it. Hazel, I reign right now from the cross, and oh, how the world laughs, scoffs. How foolish, how weak. We want a roaring lion to save us, a vicious, frightening, aggressively fighting lion. We do not want a weak, sacrificed lamb. But now, Hazel, as my disciple, as one who wants to learn how to be, how to live with a capital L here in Sherwood Park, I'm asking you to do the same. I know your days can be full of pain, disappointment, hard to take stuff, but I'm asking you to deny yourself, to cease to be the object of your life your decisions. Take up your cross and follow me. Hazel, you need to die to that independent self-sufficiency. I did not create you a creature to be independent of me, your creator, ever. I am your covenant partner. We will do life together. Me with you and we will triumph. We'll overcome through sacrificial love. Suddenly one of my favorite verses came into focus. Matthew 11, 28, 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Hazel, come to me, because you are tired and weary of trying to manage your pain and suffering disappointment and betrayal, evil and rebellion, and all the consequences. Bend down your neck. Take my yoke, and we will plow together my way, my victorious, overcoming way. Learn from me. We will overcome not as roaring lions, but as gentle, humble lambs, and we will make the kingdom of heaven come to earth, my ultimate purpose. And you will find rest from your self-sufficiency. Hazel, it is not until you enter that rest that you will fulfill your purpose for being created. What a new vision that is for me. And for the first time, I am beginning to understand Eugene Peterson's translation of that verse in the message. Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And you'll learn to walk freely and lightly. Now you know how it goes. You wake up in the morning and you send what you honestly believe is an encouraging email to somebody and it's misunderstood, and it comes back. And you cry out, oh God, 
Give me grace. Undeserved favor for me. And in turn, I turn to that person and I give that grace away, that undeserved favor. And then I get going on the supper that my husband and I are going to get ready for these friends. And he vacuums and I cook. And 10 minutes past five, they call and tell us they've been invited to an Oilers game. They won't be coming to supper tonight. God, give me grace. Give me your undeserved favor. And I turn around and I give that family that same undeserved favor. The unforced rhythms of grace. Easy? No. Natural? No. Victorious? Liberating? Yes. As I plow with the lamb who has complete wisdom, complete power, he sets me free to be who I was meant to be by doing what I was meant to do in sacrificial love. And the Almighty One is placed in excellent display. I am satisfied and creation all around me my family, my neighbors, pets and animals, the earth, benefits, and I live. And so I say with Daryl Johnson, the lamb has broken through and exposed the lie and enabled me, Hazel, slowly but surely to move into the light, to know the truth that sets me free. In the light, I am no longer afraid because I lie to create a world that I think will make me safe. In the light, I see the Lamb who loves me and is Lord over all that threatens me, and I can dare to walk in his truth, the truth of Psalm 91. I want to be like the Lamb, full of light and integrity. I want to follow the lamb, plow with the lamb wherever he goes, and I want to be known by the song that I sing, the song of Moses and of the lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the almighty El Shaddai. Righteous and true are your ways, you King of the nations. And I conclude, hang in with me. Just hang in with me. I conclude where I began with that declaration in heaven. Paul asks a question right after he's explained that declaration. What then shall we say to these things? What's your response to Hazel's testimony? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up on behalf of us all, is it possible that having given us his son, he would not give us everything else too? So, who will bring a charge against God's chosen people? Certainly not God. He is the one who causes them to be considered righteous. Who punishes them? Certainly not Messiah Yeshua, who died, and more than that, has been raised at the right hand of God and is actually pleading on our behalf. Who will separate us from the love of Messiah? Trouble? Hardship? Persecution, hunger, poverty, danger, 
War? No! In all these things, we are super conquerors through the one who has loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor any other heavenly rulers, neither what exists or what is coming, neither powers above or powers below, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which comes to us through Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord. Say with me. Amen. Amen. Christ calls us to do this thing. Following him calls us to do it together. But never once does he invite us to make more of ourselves than who we are. Never once does he invite us to say, I've received the good gifts that you've given me, Jesus, and now it's my way, and now I've solved it, and now I've figured it out. No, he says to us, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Christ calls you today, reminds you that that love is his love. It's available for you. We're going to conclude our service by, I'm going to invite the band back up to lead us in our last closing song. But as, as they sing, as they lead, I invite you to, to join in. The words will be on the screen to join them as we lift up Christ's name. I invite you also to sit and reflect on the, the love that you have been called to receive. And maybe you, you need to challenge yourself and say, I've not received that love. I've received a love. I've received a love of God, but I haven't received a love that was so permeating through the highs and lows of my life is what I've heard today, as I've been reminded of through scripture. Or maybe, maybe you have received that love, but you haven't, you haven't shared it with that individual person that God's put on your heart today, or maybe in the way in the world around you that you've thought. And maybe that's where you want God, to, to spend some time with you in the next few moments. So as we conclude our service, just know Christ's love is for you. And it's not the love that we often put on a greeting card or we talk about around uh, different seasons, around uh, our, our kind of communities of people that we're in. No, it's the love of 1 Corinthians 13, the all-sufficient, sacrificing love.